While we were participating in the Portland Mini Maker Fair earlier this year, we had an opportunity to give a talk about the positive uses of drones and how you can build one for yourself. guest engagement here at the museum and it's a real pleasure to be your MC today at the innovation stage. So as, I, as we kick off the stage today, it's my, it's my pleasure to really introduce the, uh, the team here that's going to talk to us all about drones. Patrick Sherman and Brian Zoliza uh, from the Roswell Flight Test Group. Together they build and crash and pilot uh, drones. So today they're going to talk to us about the current use of drones, show basics how to and build your own. After they talk, don't forget to stop by their booth. Can you guys point out where your booth is located? Right down the road here. So check out their booth after they're done with their talk. Um, and let's give them a round of applause and welcome them to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so you see a Roswell flight test crew here. Crest here, outstanding. Well, that begs the question, who is the Roswell flight test crew? Well, that would be me, my buddy Brian, and some other friends we have with us. And we're hobbyists. This is something we do because we enjoy. And uh, what we enjoy most is when we're able to, helping out our friends in the public safety community, like firefighters and scientists. Well, they're not in the public safety community, but um, you get the idea. And um, our, our real goal is to help people like you learn how to do what we do. So specifically what I want to talk to you today is about how I learned to stop worrying and love drones. Drones have got a public perception problem. Um, if you say drone, that's what everyone thinks of in their mind. They've gotten a bad rap. They get, they're getting it from everywhere. Street artists and Time Magazine are lining up to tell you how sinister drones are. Now, there's no doubt about it that our military has dramatically increased its use of drones over the past, uh, what are we looking at there, about 15 years or so. Uh, from a lowly $287 million all the way back in 1998 to um, $3.3 billion in 2010. That's a fourfold, and that's a, that translates to a fourfold increase in the number of drones which are used by the United States military. Now based on this graph alone, I think it's safe to say that if I was going to summarize what the military thinks of drones on a bumper sticker, it would look something like this. So, the Pentagon loves drones. Of course they do, we all know that. But the question with regards to drones is why? Why does the Pentagon love drones so much? That there are two reasons why the Pentagon is so fascinated by drones. One, they are cheap, and that's a relative term with the Pentagon, of course. And the second reason is because they can get to inaccessible locations. Now, if you stop and think for a minute, is there anyone else who could use an aerial sensor package which is cheap and can get to inaccessible locations? I would argue why yes. There are a couple of people, farmers and protesters and photographers and scientists and civil engineers and ranchers and relief workers and wind farm operators, and the list goes on and on and on. So my point to you would be, if you do any of these things yourself, or if you like any of these things, if you like wind power, if you like having safe bridges, then you should like drones too. And therefore, here's a bumper sticker that I think belongs on your car. All these attributes are going to get much uh, cheaper and easier to do in the future because of drone technology. Now, I'd like to go through and look at a few specific examples of how drones are being used today and how they will be used in the future. Uh, one thing drone critics like to say a lot is, oh, in the next 20 years, there are going to be 50,000 drones flying through America's skies. And I think that's probably not far off the mark. However, what most people don't realize is that they won't be spying on you. They'll be spying on wheat. The overwhelming majority of drone usage in the next several decades is going to be in agriculture. And that's because it's going to allow farmers to deploy water, herbicides, fertilizers, etc., with pinpoint precision where they're actually needed. So rather than just saturate a whole field of wheat with water, they can put the water right where it needs to be. 
There's even a company here in Portland called Honeycomb, which is working on the computer algorithms that will allow the multispectral data captured by the drones to help the farmers make those judgments. So this is very real. This is the drone revolution. It's going to be a green revolution. Did I mention these things are run by electricity? Okay, another important one there. And as hobbyists, we've had the good fortune to be able to participate in some kind of unique events which I hope foreshadow where this industry is going. For example, we've gone out and helped do wind turbine inspections. Right now, uh, when an operator needs to inspect a wind turbine, they got to send it, you can see it there on the screen, that little itty bitty hatch. Some guy's got to climb out of that with a harness and mountaineering gear and like scaffold his way down the blade. I mean, that's very dangerous, very serious work and very time consuming. With the, when, when we went out and did this, we were able to use a drone to fly up right next to the impeller blade where they saw, they thought there might be a problem and just take a look at it in a few minutes. I mean, saved hours. Not to mention we kept people from uh, potentially putting themselves in danger. Another use which we've taken a look at is identifying cold water refugia for fish in streams. This is a, a thermal image taken from a drone, one of our drones, looking straight down. The black areas you see are where the water's coldest. The blue represents water, and the other colors, the green and the red and the white, are the land around the water. This was actually back in West Virginia where they're trying to restore native brook trout. And the brook trout are a lot like our salmon here in that they really like cold water. The problem is the scientists don't know with pinpoint precision where that cold water is. A seep or a spring flows into the bottom of the stream and they, uh, but they, they can't see it with their own eyes and they can't drop a thermometer in every foot down the whole river. So we just flew over the river with the thermal imager pointing straight down and gathered this information for them. Another thing we've done is assisted firefighters, in this case by monitoring the progress of a wildland fire. But this has a lot of uses for potential public safety applications. We were recently talking to firefighters, when they say when they're fighting a structure fire, like if a house is on fire, they really like to put guys on the roof so they can cut a hole through to vent the excess heat out of the structure. But the problem is, of course, you got a guy in, you know, 100 pounds of gear standing on top of a burning building, and you do not want that guy falling through into that burning building, but they can't tell by looking where the fire is hottest underneath. But the drone, again with a thermal imager, can go up there and take a look and tell the firefighters where they're safe. So I think that's very good. Now, this being Portland, I think we all take another moment here and look at the use of drones in the service of social causes. There is an outfit called SHARK, which stands for Showing Animals Respect and Kindness. And there's a, a gun club in Philadelphia, which is sort of running canned hunts, and um, which is where they sort of daze and confuse birds, put them in little boxes, and then let them go, and then shoot them the moment they emerge, apparently. So this group used a, a uh, octocopter, like you see there, to spy on those hunts to get evidence of what they're doing to hopefully get the practice banned. Here you see journalist Tim Poole, who uh, made his name during the um, Occupy Wall Street protests, and he's holding there a Parrot AR drone, which he dubbed the Occupopter. Now this is just a little toy. You can pick one up at Brookstone and go fly it around for fun using your iPad. But he wired it up so it would transmit live video through his iPad out to the internet. So he was keeping real-time tabs on what the police were doing during the Occupy Wall Street protest with this little $300 piece of consumer goods. This is a creek which is literally running red with blood. This image was captured by a hobbyist, just like us, uh, down in Texas, who was just flying for fun. He was not an environmentalist or any sort of uh, person ch trying to check up on anybody, but he saw through his goggles that he was wearing, wow, I'm betting that creek isn't supposed to be that color. So he called around, finally found the right people. Turns out this creek was right downstream from a slaughterhouse, which was just dis discharging its effluent just straight into the local waterway. So everybody went to jail, but Again, we wouldn't have gotten that without the drone, and this was kind of a lucky break, but you can see where these things could be used to inspect areas where their industrial process is underway. Here you see a drone aircraft conducting anti-poaching patrols in Africa. They've got, as you know, many endangered species over there. I believe this one was actually looking for um, people who are trying to poach rhinos for their horns. So anyway, now I'm going to bring my silent and long-suffering partner into the uh, arrangement here and he's going to tell you what exactly is FPV flying. Well, FPV flying is first person view. So when we fly these we have little cameras in the front of them. We wear typically a set of video goggles or a small video screen. We can see what it sees as we're flying it. 
So if we're flying a half a mile down range, we can go and we can observe it directly as if we're in the cockpit. So that's first person view. So your first person view of what this sees. Very handy for trying to capture just the right image or just for fun just to go flying around. It's the closest thing to flying I could think of besides you know endangering your life with some kind of a contraption. All right. So now in order to do FPV flying, which is sort of the hobbyist term for a drone aircraft with these capabilities, you're going to need two things. The first thing is a remote control aircraft capable of stable controlled flight and a, um, and a video transmitter to send back the live. And then on the ground, you're going to need some means of controlling it and um, some means of watching your video, a video receiver and some goggles. So. Um, this, this technology is moving forward very, very quickly. Uh, just in the past you know, eight months or so, we've seen all kinds of, and you see some examples here, all kinds of these aircraft coming out, prepackaged, ready to go, out of the box, just put the propellers on and go flying. But this is Maker Fair. We don't, no, we don't want this out of the box thing. We want to build our own. It's going to come out looking more like that, but it works good. So if you want to build your own FPV multi-rotor, these are the things you're going to need. Start with an airframe. So basically the airframe is just physically the frame. It holds all the components together. This is a uh, quadcopter, so four sides here, four propellers, and the frame is just this piece here. This one's uh, fiberglass. Yep. This one's also fiberglass, actually. It's a little heavier frame, same design. You can also, you can also, I and mean, these are obviously pre-cut, but you can also make your own using wood or aluminum tubing or what are, what are some other things you can make them out of? Uh, pretty much in plastic, people print them now in 3D printers. So anything that's just rigid and solid, it can't, not, it can't twist or bend. It's all needs to be solid. And next up, oh, next up you're going to need uh, propellers and motors. These are, we use electric motors. Yep, these little electric motors here are normally used on model airplanes. And so are the propellers for that matter. So they're fixed pitch propellers and small electric AC motors. Now one big advantage of these types of aircraft is the motors are the only moving parts. Consequently, they are very mechanically robust. They don't have control services to pitch up and down. As you mentioned, the propellers are fixed pitch. They're very simple and therefore very reliable, which is a big plus for something you're gonna fly around with a camera on it. And then you're also gonna need electronic speed controllers, ESCs. These little red things here convert the DC voltage coming off the battery to AC and also vary the speed of the motors. So little microcontrollers inside these little guys basically receive the signals from your transmitter and tell it how fast to go, each motor. Why would we want to vary the speeds of our propellers? I want all my propellers turning all the time. Well, we want to vary the speeds of propellers because this is how it remains stable. So if, you, if it's hovering and you want to move to the left or right, uh, these propellers have to slow down slightly or speed up, or if you have an outside force like wind or if you touch it, it has to remain stable, so it has to vary the speed because it cannot vary the pitch. So unlike a helicopter, which rotates the, the actual blades themselves, the speed has to change. Now, um, one thing to be aware of is these are all kind of fly-by-wire systems, like a modern jet fighter. They don't, um, you as the pilot, don't control each individual motor. There's a flight control system, which conveniently appears on as our very next item, which, uh, which is making hundreds of inputs a second just to keep it stable in the air. And then your command input is laid in on top of that. So you want to go forward, the back two motors speed up, the front two ones speed down, it pitches forward and starts to move. So I'll talk to them a little bit about flight controllers. Well, the flight controllers come in all sizes and shapes. This one is an Arduino microcontroller, been reprogrammed and repurposed to be a flight controller. It talks to the ESCs, it talks to the radio, and it talks to a couple of components stolen from Nintendo Wii. So basically, it it handles all the calculations required to make this fly, and when you give it input, you're telling it where to go, not how to do it, not how to fly. Yeah, this one is, is one of the older ones in our fleet. It, um, it actually literally uses parts scavenged from a Nintendo Wii, the accelerometers and gyroscopes, in order to determine its position in space. And, uh, and are, there, are there any more, more sophisticated flight control systems available, or are we yeah. st stuck with ruining video games? Well, this one, I guess you can see as well, there's a small little box inside this one here, which is a commercially available flight controller. It's not open source, it's not modifiable, but it's a little bit more robust as far as its uh, flight characteristics. And these ones can also be upgraded with uh, simple things like waypoints, uh, return to home, GPS. Um, difference being they cost a lot more because you're buying a complete component versus building your own. But typically they're better 
through the fly out of the box, though. It'll take you less time to get this flying than it would that way. Cost you more, too. Yes. All right. And the last thing you're going to need is a radio receiver. That's a transmitter, actually. That's true. The, the receiver is this thing's opposite number. See this ridiculously long antenna here? This is actually for a 72, 72 megahertz system. All the newer ones use 2.4 gigahertz, so the antennas are tiny. But if you follow this wire all the way back, you'll find a box right there. And that's the receiver. It's got inputs from the radio, and then it sends out control outputs to the aircraft. That's how you control it. So next, you've, you've done all that. You've got a brilliant little aircraft. You can go fly around for fun, but we want a drone. So we've got to add the FPV systems to our aircraft. And that starts with a camera, sometimes more than one. So here we have a couple cameras. We have a GoPro sports camera. It records in high definition on board, so we can utilize that video once we've landed the aircraft safely. It also can transfer video back to our video goggles through this wire here. We also have a small secondary camera. And those are both wired to a video switch and goes to a video on-screen display so we can see our altitude, speed, how far we are from home, and a small video transmitter. This little antenna right here is our video transmitter. This one's 5.8 gigahertz, so it's a very small antenna, which is not nice. so it fits the dome here. But they come in different frequencies. What are those frequencies? Because it happens video transmitters are the very next subject we're going to talk about. Well, the most commonly used frequencies are 900 megahertz, 1.2 to 1.3 gigahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, and 5.8 gigahertz, which are shared with Wi-Fi frequencies. So if there's a lot of Wi-Fi, you want to avoid those frequencies. All right. And then the last thing we want to tell them about is telemetry, which you already kind of touched on. But why is it important? Why do we want telemetry? Well, telemetry is important because if you're flying this and you're flying it further away you can physically see, you want to know how high you are, how fast you're going, where home is. Uh, we were once flying in the desert and I couldn't tell which bush was the next one getting home, so I had to kind of look around for it. But so now then, you, then you got telemetry. telemetry. And it just tells you that home is you know, 300 feet in that direction. And it, you can follow the line, line right back to home. And also this tells you the current status of your battery, with, which with an electrically powered aircraft that can neither glide nor auto-rotate is an important consideration. Exactly. So we'll actually have this running as a demo over here at our booth. We're taking people for drone runs, and you can see the telemetry for yourself. So now you've got an FPV aircraft, which is cool and all, but you're going to need something, some stuff on the ground to control it. And that includes, well, this, uh, tra this transmitter or one like it? Yes. Probably one like it because we've already got this one. So tell us about this thing. Well, this particular one is a, basically an off-the-shelf hobby radio. It's not been modified in any way. So you can use the same radio as the control little model airplanes or these. Essentially, uh, we've got uh, two sticks here for control. We've got throttle, we've got yaw, which is the aircraft twisting, and then pitch and roll, which move the aircraft's forward, backward, left, and right. And the other switches are for, you know, uh, video switches, uh, return to home features, whatever accessories you want. But the most basic controls are these four sticks and an arm switch. Got to have an on switch. Very important to have an on switch. If you buy one of these and there's no on switch, take it back to the store where you bought it. Um, and then, of course, you want to see all this lovely video you're transmitting. So you need a video receiver and some sort of video display. Yes, basically any a TV works just fine for that. Uh, preferably one that can see static. Uh, it uses the old analog NTSC and TVs from 10 years ago. So you either have to have video goggles, a small display, and a good small antenna to receive the video. And once you've got that, you can go fly. You can, and we're going to be doing that right down here next to the Pirates. So any questions? Are there any laws that you should be aware of as the prospective civilian drone operator? Why yes, I'm glad you asked. To tell you the truth, I cut that out of this presentation because everyone always says it's boring, and lo and behold, that's the very first question I'm asked. All right, so the laws are thus. There are no state laws in Oregon which would prohibit you in any way. We managed to turn that back when we stopped Senate Bill 71. Thank you, thank you. A big team effort from everybody in the community. Um, the, the main law you have to worry about is what's called Advisory Circular 9157 which was written by an FAA administrator all the way back in 1981 because they decided they finally needed some kind of rules to govern all these model airplanes flying around. And so those, those same rules, 1981, are still in force today. Obviously, I don't think they could have dreamt that we were going to have these little you know, drones with cameras on them flying around, but those are still the rules. 
And Advisory Circular 9157 basically says this, don't fly over or near anything or anyone that's going to be hurt or damaged if your aircraft falls out of the sky. I hope that's common sense. Um, don't fly within three miles of an airport unless you notify the airport manager or control tower or something. Again, probably pretty self-explanatory, that one. And then the last thing you really got to watch out for is stay below 400 feet above ground level. Because in the perfect world, your manned aircraft are going to be at 500 feet and above. And we don't want unmanned and manned aircraft interacting. That would be all kinds of bad. Um, and and the, last, the last rule, the last portion of it is don't interfere with manned aircraft. They get the right of way. You see a manned aircraft, you put your machine on the ground, etc., etc. It's all just common sense safety stuff, but obviously that's the most important part of what we do is be safe. So what else we got? Any more questions? Sir? Right. He just asked, is there something in Advisory Circular 9157 about flying outside your line of sight that is so far away you can no longer with your own eyes determine the orientation of the aircraft in the air and therefore fly it remotely? No, that is not included in Advisory Circular 9157 because they, in, like I said, in, in 81 they probably hadn't a clue what was coming. But that is in AMA, the Academy of Model Aer Aeronautics, document 550, which is their governing document for, um, for FPV flight operations. And that says you cannot fly out of line of sight with your FPV aircraft. So yes, that's where you saw that. That's not a law. The AMA is a good organization that we both belong to, and it's watching out for our interests, and it is moving by leaps and bounds towards more involvement in FPV. They're really up to some remarkable stuff. Stay tuned. But for the moment, that is what AMA 550 says. So that's where you heard that. What else? Well, you guys are asking all the legal questions. You know, that's the, that is actually the second slide I cut out of this presentation because people told me it was boring. Well, it's usually very boring. <laughs> this, is, this is an extremely savvy crowd. <laughs> well, oh, sir, yes. Where do we get the software that manages the stabilization and the navigation? By the way, this is so a him question. Well, actually, it, Google Code. Most of the software uh, for the different projects are posted online as open source software. This is MultiWe, so you can go to multiwecopter.com and get that, or you can go to Google Code and get the download for the most current version. And it's constantly being updated and changed, so just be aware of new versions that aren't reported as stable, because it may not be. <laughs> yeah, stability in code is one thing. Stability in an aircraft is quite another. And one of the big dogs right now in this industry is um, Ardu Pilot, uh, 3D Robotics. Yep, 3D Robotics, um, DIY copters, uh, or DIY drones. They have uh, basically the code base online for their Arduino-based systems. And you can just download that and, and tweak it and play with it and modify it. It's got a lot of features that don't apply to this type of an aircraft, which you can add more sensors to it, avoidance sensors, GPS, a lot of things that this does not have. But it's very easy to add those in with the software where you can pilot. And then um, out of the box, it can uh, take, I think it's up to 166 waypoints. This commercial one here, which costs about the same as the current Ardu Pilot, um, has zero waypoint capability, you know, zilch. And the Ardu Pilot's got that. I've, we actually have never really gotten the chance to play around much with it, but it's supposed to be a little touchy, but an extremely robust feature set. So. Yeah, the multi is very close to the Ardu Pilot, so it's, very, it's still Arduino-based in this case. So you can, you can code it, you can make modifications to the way it operates pretty easily. And then there are commercial systems like the one in here. You can get much more sophisticated ones that give you that same waypoint capability, but the price is significantly higher. E e a thousand bucks, easy. Yeah, and the software is downloadable from the manufacturer website, but you can't modify it, though. Yeah, it's a closed system, obviously. Okay, what else? In this amazing crowd. Yes, ma'am. The uh, question was, you need a ham radio license for something, and the answer is absolutely correct. These little video transmitters kick out too much power to be operated, you know, just because you're a citizen of the United States, to legally operate one of these video transmitters, except below 25 milliwatts, 25 milliwatts. which would give me a nice clean signal from about me to you, um, you need a ham radio license. So go, uh, go, go study up and get your ham license. Well, thank you. You've been a lovely audience. If, if the question occurs to you later, we're just down here next to the Pirates. We're going to be flying demonstration flights all day. Pirates are also going to be setting off cannons this afternoon, so be ready for that. Anyway, we hope you'll come by and see us. Thank you so much. It's been great to have this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you.